Hi, Paul. Good to see you. Um, it's very cold and blistery out there, so I'm glad I'm inside keeping warm. Um, I understand yeah, you want to talk about the House of Wealth today. Yeah, absolutely. So this is your concept for taking someone who's um, looking to build, build for their financial future, right? That's right, yeah. I, I found that financial planning can be very complicated. It's like anything. When we don't know about something, things can be very complicated and uncertain. And I wanted a way of organizing the fundamental areas of financial planning in one simple illustration or diagram. And I developed, along with some friends, a thing called the House of Wealth. And the House of Wealth has, in my example, four areas. It has the foundations, then it has three stories. The foundations are things that I want everyone to consider. So it doesn't mean you should have them. It means as an adult, you should consider them and evaluate whether you need them. There are actually three that you must have, but the others you should consider. And then there are three stories, security, independence, and freedom. Okay. Okay. Would you like me to go through okay. one? Foundations then. Yeah, sure. Okay. So the financial foundations starts with um, emergency cash. Ooh. So emergency cash is basically the amount of money you need to hold on deposit. It's a bit too small, isn't it? You hold on deposit to cover anything that is an emergency. So an emergency might be something like um, your car breaking down. It might be the, in this weather, particularly the boiler going, something like that. Um, it wouldn't be something like your son or daughter needs to go on a school trip or your best friends come over and you really want to go out, but you spent your WAM money. Remember we spoke about your WAM money in previous um, videos. So an emergency cash is that exactly that. It's an emergency. Okay. And how much? Well, what we tend to say is if you have unsecured debt, so if you have money that's on credit cards or loans, I want that money gone first. But if we didn't keep any emergency cash available to us and something happened while we're paying off our debt, then we're going to be in stuck. We're going to be stuck. So if you have unsecured debt, I'd like you to keep one thousand pounds as an emergency reserve. Now, for some of you, you may never have saved a thousand pounds in your life, and that will be a challenge, a goal in its own right. And you should go at it with every bit of passion and tenacity that you have until you do have the thousand pounds saved. Then you pay off your unsecured debt. And then once your unsecured debt's repaid. I then want you to increase the emergency reserve or the emergency cash from anything between three and 12 months of your expenditure. Okay. Now, three and 12 months is a massive variance. And the, the reason for the variance is if you're an employed individual and you live on your own, for example, and you have no one depending on you, three months will probably be sufficient because you may easily be able to go and cut your expenses a little bit and go and find alternative work if you've got made redundant, that is, okay? Um, if you're on commission only, or you have like a, what I term as a burn to earn income stream, so your money comes in, it just seems to go on things, um, or it's highly fluctuating, or you have a large family and people rely on you financially, maybe towards 12 months of your expenditure is more important. Okay. Okay. But between three and 12 months, if you don't have anything at the moment, then obviously something's better than nothing. And if you can't decide, if you can't quite work it out, just go for six months. Drop right in the middle and go for six months. And this is six months of your expenditure, not income, but of your expenditure. Okay, great. Okay, All right, so that's foundation one. That's foundation one. That's emergency. I think everybody should have number one, emergency cash. Now, the second one is life assurance. And with life assurance, I want you to consider whether you need it. Now, life assurance typically comes in the form of term assurance. And what I look for, to do is I want you to make sure that your debts are covered. So if you have a mortgage, you have um, unsecured debt, your debts are covered, and you have about £5,000 set aside for a funeral expense. Okay. So typically this will be arranged in the form of term assurance. And you'll generally find if you're in a relationship with someone, you have a joint mortgage, it is probably more cost effective if you have two separate term assurance policies 
asked to propose to one joint term insurance policy. A um, couple of reasons for that. Obviously, if you both were to die, you would get a double payout, uh, and that money might help dependents if you have some dependent children. Um, but a second reason as well is we can make a single life insurance policy paid into a trust, and that will speed up payment and also keep the money outside of your estate, whereas a joint life policy can't be written in trust easily, and therefore the money will be paid into the estate. Okay. okay. And this is, this is optional. Who, who should consider life insurance then? Well, let's face it. If you're a single individual and you have a mortgage and there's equity in your property, do you really need life insurance? How important is it your mortgage is paid off if you were to die? Possibly not. But if you're in a, a relationship, if you're married and one of the parties doesn't work, well, if they're left with a big mortgage payment to pay every month, they might be disadvantaged by the death. So certainly if you leave behind a dependent or dependent, so you say, for example, children, you, I think you should consider life insurance. Okay. Okay. So we've covered the mortgage and debt. The other thing you need to bear in mind is, do I need to insure my income for death? So for example, if I were to die, my home, house mortgage can be repaid, but actually, do I need a regular income being paid to provide or rec uh, uh, replace my lost income? So my spouse, my partner, um, has some money to live in the house. So obviously the uh, council tax and the gas electric and all the bills still come in um, so you can weigh up that and with a income you look at a family income benefit policy so you'd have two policies you'd have a um, term insurance policy that would cover the debt and you'd have a family income benefit policy to cover the income let me just get that I'll just clear that one second there you go that's fine um, so that's life insurance. So you've got two things with life insurance. You've got the debt to be covered and then you've got your income to be covered. It's two things to bear in mind. Okay. So that's optional. And the next one we move along to is optional as well, but it's something that I think most people seriously um, need to consider and don't often do that. And that's disability insurance. So in, in uh, the financial world, it's called income protection. And basically this is an insurance that pays out if you're unable to work now unable to work is obviously a, a subjective term so there are definitions behind that and it's typically if you're unable to work to do your own job then the policy will become payable okay. so unable to work, do your own job through long-term uh, sorry through accident or long-term sickness um, there's a waiting period what we call a deferred period and that could be anything from four weeks up to say a year and the longer we have as a deferred period a waiting period before the insurance gets paid the cheaper the premiums okay so if you look at the how this all links together if we've got six months of emergency cash sat in the bank well maybe we can have a waiting period of six months before this policy pays out because it will be cheaper premiums okay um, so most certainly the self-employed need to consider this. So if you run your own business, this is almost an essential insurance. Um, disability is often a fate worse than death because you're still alive and you have bills to cover. Um, but employed individuals as well will often get a form of um, long-term sick pay from their employer. It varies massively, um, anything from literally statutory um, all the way up to maybe a year. But, Certainly worth considering, another insurance to consider. Okay. Is that good with that? Yeah. Yep. On to the next. Yeah. Okay. So the next insurance we consider is critical illness. Okay. So critical illness insurance is an insurance that we say we would like you to consider this insurance but only once your unsecured debts have been repaid. Okay, and the reason for that is it's, it's a nice insurance to have, but it can be a bit more expensive. And um, I, I think from a financial planning perspective, one of our primary goals is to produce financial security. And you achieve that very quickly by paying off your unsecured debts. So if you don't have any unsecured debts, then great, consider it. Consider an amount of money that might be enough to pay off the mortgage or amount of money that might just be helpful if you had a, a critical illness to ease that stressful time. But a critical illness policy is something that we say is optional 
and certainly would be considered only after your um, unsecured debts is paid off. Okay. okay. It pays out on certain things like a diagnosis of a cancer or something like that. Um, and it generally pays out a lump sum. Okay. okay. Uh, the next insurance that we ask that you consider is private medical insurance. Now, private medical insurance basically pays for a private consultant at a private hospital if you would need care. So if you were to have an accident and you were to rush to the hospital, you would go through the standard A&E process like everybody else, and you would be treated exactly the same. And it's at the time when you're discharged from the A&E that you would either go into the NHS ward or be sent home, or you'd be sent to a private ward. Okay. Um, another example when you might use private medical insurance is if you went to see your GP and your GP wanted to refer you for further consultation, you would tell your GP that you had private medical insurance and you'd be referred to a private ward or a private hospital to see a consultant. The individuals you see generally are the same individuals, whether you see them privately or through the um, NHS system. It's just that they tend to work at uh, two diaries, one for the NHS, which generally is full and quite often full for several weeks or months in advance, or a private diary, which you often can get in within a couple of weeks notice. So the thing I like about private medical insurance is that if you run your own business and there is something wrong and you need to get it sorted out and it's preventing you from working at optimum speed, the private medical insurance will allow you to get that treatment quicker and more efficiently, often the same treatment, but it'll get you quicker and more efficiently and allow you to revert back to work as normal. Okay. okay. Private medical insurance, like most insurances, have an excess um, and the excess is the amount you pay prior to the insurance company picking up the claim. And we typically say try and aim for that to be as high as possible, bearing in mind you've got your emergency cash. Okay, so that would be an emergency if you're using it, so that can pick up the excess. And generally speaking, around about £250 is a reasonable level to have. And that's often the first consultation with a, a consultant. Okay. So, and then the final of the insurances is something that we probably most of, most of us have got anyway, but I put on here because quite often um, we're underinsured, and that's general insurance. Now, general insurance are things like your home, your car, um, your travel. These are called general insurances. That's the actual term for them. Um, and this is an area where you can make great savings. There's lots of comparison sites online, um, but please when you're insuring yourself, make sure you have adequate insurance. The number of people that I meet who have insufficient property insurance or contents insurance um, is, you know, it surprises me. So make sure you have adequate insurance, but shop around and try and get the best deal. And again, okay. they come with excesses, like most people are aware of these, and that's the first amount of money you pay before a claim. Okay? So that, yep. that, that, that's all the insurances Okay, there's two areas, two more areas that I need you all to consider. And these two areas are essential for anyone over 18. So the emergency cash, the first one, and the last two are essential. Um, I'll go with uh, wills to start off with. Wills and trusts. Now, if you have listened to any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm always harping on about wills and the importance of wills um, and trusts within wills. Um, if you have dependent children, um, it is absolutely essential, and I would go as far as say it's negligent if you don't have a will. Please go and arrange a will. Um, a will basically is a legal document that tells the people, your executors typically, what to do with your estate in the event of you passing away. It says who should get certain items, who should get your property, and who should look after your children. That's the most important. And the reason I say it's most important is because if you have dependent children and you don't have a will, social services step in to look after your children until the courts can decide who should take care of them. Now, if you, if you run a scenario that your children have lost their parents, 
that they're all completely distressed anyway, the last thing they want to do is go off with a stranger, albeit I'm sure they'll do a wonderful job. They want to be with someone they know, love, and trust in a familiar environment. So a will for a parent with a dependent child is essential. And I would say it's also good practice for everyone to have a will, just so we know what's going to happen, what your wishes are, and also go as far as make, putting your uh, funeral wishes in there, burial or cremation. Okay, um, perhaps for another time, but there are some very good reasons for including trust within your will, not to avoid taxes, but purely to protect assets to ensure that they go down to people, ultimately who you want them to. Okay. okay. Okay, and then the last item um, that I think everyone over the 18 should have, irrespective if you have children or not, um, I'm going to put down as LPAs, are lasting powers of attorney. And again, I harp on about these quite often. Lasting power of attorney basically are documents that um, become useful if you're unable to make decisions on your own behalf. There are two types of LPAs. The first one is called a health and welfare basically covers your health and medical um, decisions, would be very useful for your spouse, significant other, your someone you love and trust, to be able to talk to social services, the NHS, in the event of you not being able to do it yourself. Uh, the second document is a property and affairs, which is basically the financial LPA, and that enables your attorneys to make financial decisions on your behalf. Um, draw money out of the bank account, sell certain assets, pay for items like care fees if you need to. All these things stop if you lose mental capacity. Um, and if you don't have an LPA, you need to get um, deputy ship from the court of protection, which is a very time consuming and expensive process. And obviously during that period of time, no one you trust is making decisions for you. These are simple documents, Go and get them done. It's essential health and welfare and property affairs and make sure you register them. There's no point just filling the form in. Some people just fill the form in and say, I've done it. You then have to register it with the Office of Public Guardian. Okay. Okay. I've got passionate, passionate enough about that then. Was that okay? It's, uh, I get a bit yeah. evangelical about wills and LPAs because I think they are admin things and people put them to one side. And I think what you need to do is just get yeah. your foundations. House of Wealth, these are the foundations. These are the basics. First one, emergency cash, essential. Life insurance, income protection, critical illness, medical, general insurance, consider them. You may not want any of them, but at least have an informed decision to evaluate whether you need them. Wills and trusts, get one done. LPAs, absolutely essential. Okay, great. So that's the gold standard for the foundations then, making sure that we're protecting what we're about to build with our house. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, then we move on to um, our house, our, our building, as it were. Um, and then what we talk about is security. Okay, so financial security. In we define, and so we've gone now from having our, our basics in place to actually uh, defining where we are financially in our growth, in our progression. Because we, we start from zero as it were sometimes we start from minus you know with lots of debts um and we want to achieve um independence we want to be independent so we can retire basically that's what most people want to do so we break up the journey into milestones and we do that so that you can see that you are progressing you are making progress and we think that's important for uh, reinforcement to encourage uh, and stay motivated and the first level is called financial security and we would deem that you are financially secure when all of your unsecured debts are repaid and you have a fully funded emergency reserve. Okay. Okay. So all of your unsecured debts are repaid and you have a fully funded emergency reserve. We say that is financial security. And we say, congratulations, you've achieved that. Give yourself a pat on the back. That's more than probably 90% of a lot of people ever do during their working life. Okay. Then we move up to the next level, which is financial independence. Okay. Then we talk about financial independence. And financial independence, we define is having sufficient capital or reoccurring income that it meets 
your basic living expenses. Okay. So what we mean by that is that you have a, a, a lump sum of capital that is able to provide you with an income that meets your basic living expenses. Okay, and what are my basic living expenses? Okay, your basic living expenses generally we define as your bills account payments. So we would look at your bills account, we've covered the banking system previously, we'd look at your bills account, and we would say things like your rent or your mortgage payment, your gas, your electric, your water, your wham, your general spending money. Okay, your general living expenses coming out to allow you to exist, you know, day to day without worrying. So if we said, for example, those general living expenses are a thousand pounds a month, okay, you would need a lump sum of money of 300 times that figure to generate the thousand pounds a month. So a thousand pounds a month, you'd need about 300,000 pounds to generate a thousand pounds a month. Okay. okay. So 300,000 pounds at an interest rate of 4% would generate 12,000 pounds a year or 1,000 pounds a month. Okay. So that's a good sort of rule of thumb definition of how we would define financial independence. Then the next and the final level that we go to when we talk about um, the wealth building is financial freedom. And we define financial freedom as either being your current lifestyle or the lifestyle that you would uh, aspire to. But there could be a difference. So this lifestyle here would include things like holidays, travel, additional things, capital purchase, things you want to buy. Okay, maybe doing further education or gifting money. So the freedom is basically either your current lifestyle, so i.e. what your current lifestyle is like, but if you are on an accumulation stage and you think, well, actually, I want more than what I've currently got, I don't want to settle what I currently have, I want to work for more, then it's basically the lifestyle that you are aspire to. Okay. Okay. And if we looked at a similar sort of example, if we said, well, okay, my financial freedom would be £2,000 a month because that would allow me £1,000 a month to pay my basic living expenses, but in addition to that, I'll have an extra thousand pounds to do as I wish. I can go on holiday, I can drive a different car, and I can do other things I want to do. Then you would need 300 times the 2,000 pounds a month, which would be 600,000 pounds. You'd need a capital sum of money of 600,000 pounds at an income rate of 4% to generate you the 2,000 pounds a month of income to meet your financial freedom requirements. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're, so you're basically replacing in, in independence and freedom. Then you're basically replacing the need to work with um, for your basic on independence and for all your expenses on freedom, an income from work with an income from investments, for example. Correct, and those investments can come from various sources. It doesn't have to be one investment that generates this. It could be that you've set up a business that provides you a reoccurring income for some of the money. It could be that you have a rental property that provides you some of the money. It could be that you have an investment portfolio that provides you some of the money. And in later life, it could be that your state pension provides you some of the money. Okay, what we're looking for is just a reoccurring income from these assets to meet these expenses requirements. Okay. Does that be good? Yeah, so so you you're replacing you're replacing a work income with a passive income almost then, right? Yeah, and what we do the reason we're doing it is to give choice. We're giving choice. Because some people do jobs to um, just earn enough money so that they can save and invest and in inverted commas retire. Okay. Um, and what we try and say to people is try and choose work that you enjoy so that you never really want to retire. Because one of the beauties of work is um, mental stimulation and connection and um, uh, reward and contribution. So if we can reorganize our thought process so we don't always have to give up work, uh, we would always have that income from employment as well. So we kind of got a balancing act here. We're having multiple streams of income coming in. We've got an investment portfolio providing us with a bit of income. We've got a property portfolio providing us with a bit of income. We'll have our pensions. We've got our state pension. And actually, I'm enjoying work, and I'm going to carry on work, and I've got some money coming through from work as well. Yeah. Okay. So that's our house of wealth. That's what we've done. We've, we've kind of 
laid out the financial areas, the foundations, all the things that any good financial planner would go through with their client. And we've laid them down at the bottom. And then we've actually broken down the progress to ultimately retirement, if I'm fair, to look at what people look for. People aspire to it, say 60, 65, 67 sometimes. Um, but we made it a journey and we've said, okay, let's, let's call it financial security and let's define that as well. And all our unsecured debts are repaid and we've got emergency reserve. That's a really good place to start. We then progress and we look at our investment portfolio and we say, okay, although our investment portfolio and the money we have can't, isn't sufficient for me to stop working and just enjoy the lifestyle I want, it is enough to cover all my basic bills, which is brilliant. Um, and then the last one is really to say, okay, now my investment portfolio is at a sufficient level that it replaces my lifestyle. Um, and I'm, I'm happy and I can actually, I now I'm choosing to work for all the other things it gives me uh, rather than needing to work because I have to make sure I pay the bills. Yeah, okay. Uh, is that good? Great. Yeah, great, thank you. Super, brilliant. Well, look, great to speak to you. Um, and for you, everyone who's listening and watching this today, uh, please go to my social media sites, connect to me on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter, um, and can and feedback to me. Give me some ideas of what you'd like me to cover in future episodes. Um, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, thank you once again. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Bye.